Welcome to the Stressless Eating Podcast, where we help diet-obsessed and food-crazed women break themselves out of the food and body prison, end the dieting madness, and take control of their health for good. I'm your host, Leanne Ellington, and this podcast is about answering one question. How can you heal your relationship with food and your body and take a practical approach to this whole self-love journey, but without all that restriction, obsession, and shame, and without needing years of therapy to do so? If you want to know the answer, you're in the right place. All this information is 100% free, so please subscribe to and review our podcast. Hello there, and welcome to today's episode. And you know, this is one of the most personal episodes I've ever recorded, and it's definitely my most vulnerable share to date. And it's the part of my journey that I don't typically talk about or share about out loud, partially because it's still relatively new to me, but also because I feel like faith can be one of those taboo topics. Like it gets batched into conversations about religion or even politics and can have connotations or associations in meanings that might not be intended. So for purposes of this podcast and my own definitions, for me, this is a story and a tale about faith. Now, faith is something that I didn't have until recently, and it's something that I didn't even know that I didn't have in the first place, and or it's something that I didn't even know that I could have. Not to mention, I consider myself to be a scientist. I'm very logical and reasonable and would probably be described as pragmatic by my friends. And a lot of the stuff I share on this podcast in general, like if I was sitting here listening 10 or 15 years ago, I would probably be like, what, Leanne? Like, is that you? (laughs) You know, like hearing me talk, I wouldn't maybe even recognize what, what I was talking about. But over the years, my heart has softened and I'm finally emotionally available to myself. And self-love and compassion has been cultivated within me. And even though I'm the same dorky, geeky gal that I used to be, I've transformed in so many ways. But as recently as two years ago, if you said I would be talking about God and faith and my experiences walking into a Christian church as a Jewish woman, I would have thought you were joking. But I'm not joking. And this is as real as real can be. In fact, I would say it's actually the realest part of me because I once had no faith and now faith is a central part of my identity and who I am. I once had no contact, no conversation and no relationship with God. And now it's the most important relationship in my life. I once believed that I had come as far as I could have come in terms of seeing myself through the eyes of human eyes of love. And now I know what it's like to borrow the eyes of God and actually see myself as perfect and whole and complete right now. Like not having to go hustle for it or work for it or someday, you know, get there as I'm putting quotation marks up with my fingers. And when I say faith, What I mean is simply believing in something that I can't see or taste or touch or feel or experience with my human senses. To me, it's believing in miracles and possibility and stepping out into the knowingness and the unknowingness that it'll happen or come true in real life. But when you hear my story, you'll understand why I now believe in miracles And as with all my definitions of who I am, I know that my definition of faith will continue to grow and evolve as I do. And here's the reality. I wasn't looking for God. I wasn't looking for faith. It actually started out with me searching for the word surrender. So my search for surrender, which ended up causing me to search for God, took me on a journey that I could have never expected or predicted. And I'm going to share the ins and outs of that with you right now. But know this. Yes, my active faith started about two years ago, but little did I know, and you'll learn this from my story, I've had something with me and inside me all along, even if I wasn't calling it faith. And something was pushing and protecting and guarding and loving me all along, even if I wasn't calling it God. 
And so you'll hear my story and you'll hear that it has twists and turns, but I promise to bring it all back together full circle. And the only way to start is just to start. So let's dive in. So about 10 months ago, I found myself sitting in the office of Pastor Kevin, and he's the lead pastor of Nashville's Cross Point Church. And I was sitting there with Pastor Kevin and his wife, Ree, and I had an envelope with $500 in cash inside the envelope. And this wasn't our first encounter. In fact, I had met Kevin several times before that, and I'd seen and heard his wife, Ree, many times as well. And even though Pastor Kevin had offered several times to you know, support my journey or have a conversation or a chat with me, I just wasn't ready until I was ready. So for anyone that knows me, meeting with a pastor and his wife would have probably piqued their curiosity because Leanne Ellington, well, she's Jewish. I'm Jewish, you know? So growing up in Florida, this was pretty normal. I was always the Jewish one in my group of friends, but there were always at least a couple other Jewish kids in my classes. After moving to Nashville, though, there weren't as many of us, you know? And for the first couple years that I lived here, I was really the only other Jewish person that I came in contact with. Often, times I'd actually hear from my friends that I was the very first Jewish person that they'd ever actually met. Um, So just to put it in context for you, I've never been a religious Jew per se. Um, And, you know, just like most Jewish Americans, I was sent to Sunday school and Hebrew school and I had a bat mitzvah, but it was never anything I was really into or sought out myself. I went because that's just what we did in my family. But being Jewish, it was always a source of pride for our family. And for me, sure, it was the same, you know, like the culture and the sacrifice of the Jewish people and the history, the Holocaust, especially, of course, you know, the heritage, the customs, the holidays, the Hebrew language. And yes, I actually speak a decent amount of Hebrew, which I'll explain in a bit. And Israel. I love Israel. And I actually lived there three different times, which I'll also explain. But God, you know, Judaism was never a connection to God for me. It was never faith. In my eyes, it was a culture and simply just part of who I am, like a really proud part. But in my eyes, I wasn't religious or, you know, very Jewish, as I used to say as a kid. And God, it wasn't even a topic in conversations that I remember. Until a couple of years ago, I didn't even know that I didn't have God in my life. It just wasn't even really in my consciousness. Okay, so side note, you heard me say that I speak Hebrew and lived in Israel three times, but that I'm not that Jewish, as I put in quotes. So let me just clarify. So... The reason I know Hebrew is because in college, I went to the University of Florida, and my brothers, who were also there, had had been there, told me that if you know a little bit of like how to read and write Hebrew, that if you just take Hebrew 101, it's an easy A. And so being who I was as a college student, I took Hebrew 101 because I just wanted to get an easy A. But I actually loved it. And so I ended up taking Hebrew 2 and Hebrew 3. But also during the summers, if I wasn't overseas for study abroad, I worked at a Jewish summer camp where half the international staff were Israeli and spoke Hebrew. So I loved practicing my Hebrew with them. And we got to like, you know, talk about the campers behind their backs in Hebrew without them knowing it because we'd speak Hebrew and they wouldn't understand us. So that's how Hebrew came into play for me. But still, you know, it was not a connection to God or a faith for me. And that leads me to the topic of Israel. So when I was in, I think, fourth grade, my oldest brother was in probably 10th grade and he was getting into a lot of trouble. And it was nothing crazy, just like he was getting bad grades. He was hanging out with the wrong crowd, that kind of thing. But my parents wanted to teach him some maturity and kind of like, you know, grow him up and mature him. And so they didn't want to do anything drastic, like send him to boarding school or anything like that. And since my parents were always trying to get us to hang out with more Jewish kids, they sent my brother to this program called High School in Israel. And it's like, it's basically a study abroad program for high schoolers where 
you learn about the history of Israel and you learn about the history of Judaism, but it's not a religious program. Um, and so you go and you live in these co-ed dorms and it's part classroom, like you're partially in a classroom. And then also like the actual land of Israel is your classroom and you're traveling around all over Israel and it's this amazing program. And so my parents kind of use this program as this attempt to kind of straighten him out. Um, and according to them, he came back this changed man, like he was all grown up and they were so happy that they sent him. And so they decided then and there that all four of us kids would go for various reasons. So I always knew, like since I was pretty young, that my junior year of high school, I would be going to Israel. And so honestly, I have to say, I wasn't that excited. Like, I know that sounds weird and probably ungrateful, but as a kid and a teenage girl, like that didn't excite me because I pictured, you know, deserts and camels. And so needless to say, though, I went and it was life changing for me and it was life changing in my own way. And I fell in love with Israel when I was a kid, you know. So on the program, we had these college age counselors that were kind of like dorm RAs. And I remember thinking like, I would love to do that when I'm their age. It's It was kind of like being a camp counselor, but overseas. And, you know, so many moons later, I graduated from college and I had all these amazing experiences with Hebrew and I had all of my Israeli friends from camp and I was already kind of in nomadic traveler mode because, you know, studying abroad really put that in me. Um, And so I did it. I applied and they actually originally said no. And they said no to me because they they told me they wanted somebody who spoke Hebrew and who actually lived in Israel so that they can interview them in person. And so I accepted the no gracefully, but I was just being who I am. I was like, I'm not going to take no for an answer. So I just kept reaching out to them and I kept giving them the argument of like, listen, I'm not fluent in Hebrew, but I took three semesters in Hebrew and I actually want to come there and learn more Hebrew. And and I even said, I was like, I'll come there to interview. Like I'm so committed. Um, and I actively fought for the job and crazy enough, I I ended up convincing them and they, they hired me. They hired me to come work for them. Um, so I did that a total of three times. And one of those times I also went there early and I lived in Haifa, which is in the North. Um, and I found this apartment in Haifa and I enrolled in this, it's called an Ulpan, which is this intensive Hebrew study. And it was at the university of Haifa. So I had this amazing life in Israel. I had a job that I loved. I had friends from camp. So this amazing social circle. I had Israeli boyfriends, which is a subject for another episode on its own. Um, But this absolute love for Israel and Jewish people and Hebrew, but still no God, right? And so none of this was God or faith for me. And like I said before, I didn't even realize at the time that I didn't have God. So there is your context. I'm a full blown, as in like both of my parents are Jewish, Israel loving, Hebrew speaking Jew. And here I am 10 months ago, sitting in a pastor's office of a Christian church, about to hand him an envelope with $500 in cash. So I'm going to come back to this story and tell you what happened in Pastor Kevin's office in just a moment. But first, I want to tell you about bamboo, which I know sounds really random, but I promise you it's relevant. So I know it appears like all of a sudden I wanted God or faith or when you hear my story that like miracles and magic just started blessing my life. But that is not what I believe happened. I feel like I planted those seeds a long time ago, or I would actually now say that God planted those seeds without me knowing it. Um, But so bamboo. So there's this idea of being an overnight success or an overnight anything. And bamboo is a plant that people think grows really, really fast. And it does actually grow really, really fast at its prime, but it's deceiving because legend has it, or you can just Google it, (laughs) that apparently if you plant bamboo seeds the first three to five years, it almost looks like there's nothing there and that nothing is happening because everything, all of the growth, the root system, all of it, it's happening underground. But any wise bamboo farmer would know to keep watering the bamboo and making sure it has daylight and nutrient-rich soil and all that good stuff 
because apparently around the third to fifth year, depending on the kind of bamboo plant that it is, the bamboo finally like peeps its head out from underground and starts growing above ground. Then in its prime, it grows really, really fast, like really, really fast, sometimes growing an inch and a half an hour. I mean, like really fast, right? So again, to an outsider, it looks like it grew overnight. But what you can't see is everything that's happening underground and how long it actually took. And so a lot of people look at my life and they think that making over my body and losing all that weight and that I was some over, you know, some overnight success. And they look at my business and think that it was an overnight success. And they look at my life and my accomplishments, including this podcast, and they think it was all an overnight success. And now my faith journey, it looks like all of a sudden I just like it suddenly appeared and everything was magic. But here's what I say about that. The seeds get planted and the growth often happens underground. So for example, when it comes to my body, I haven't been, you know, society's definition of overweight in a very long time. It's been something like 15 years. And so 15 years ago when I lost the weight, you know, you would probably look at my body and you wouldn't have known that, first of all, I was ever overweight or that I wasn't happy and confident after losing a third of my body weight. But as you've heard through my story in previous episodes of this podcast, I lost all this weight, but still never shifted my identity and the self-image and body image that was causing me to think and act and feel and behave like I was still carrying around a lot more weight on my body than I was because my self-image was still fat. And even if my body was no longer looking that way, right, it was like this body dysmorphia that I didn't know how to deal with. And I went underground to go heal it. But that's the part that you don't see. And so now I'm here and I'm sharing my truths and you see all the fruits of my labors, but it's all that stuff that you didn't see that made it all possible. And here I am today. And I'm still sharing with you on this podcast the challenges that I still have with my own self-image and my own body, right? My business is another great example of this. Like people look at me today and they're like, wow, she just, you know, exploded overnight. And I'm like, uh, nope. (laughs) Where were you 15 years ago when I was going through everything that I was going through and failing a thousand times, right? Um, And so what most people don't know is that, yeah, like in the scheme of things, my first business was seemingly successful overnight because I was in the fitness business. Like I didn't have to reinvent the wheel. I could just take a business model that was proven and make it better or just like make it my own and Leanize it. And that's what I did. And yes, that was kind of an example of an overnight success. But what happened after that was absolutely a product of the bamboo principle. Like what I do today and the work that I'm doing here, including the messages of stressless eating, there was no proven model. Like there was no system that I could follow. In fact, there was and still is a multi-billion dollar industry spreading the exact opposite of what I'm sharing and what I was sharing. Like that dieting and weight loss is the answer and the solution. And, you know, stressless eating, no way. Like that was all new seeds that I had to plant and water and tend to every day for years before I could see the fruits of its labor. And those are seeds that I simply had to gather from scratch. But also, And here's where I'll come back to this faith conversation. Even though I didn't necessarily have God, I can look back at everything that happened and see where God just totally had my back and see where he was filling in the gaps for me. And I was never alone, even when I felt like I was. So for example, continuing with the faith that was needed to transition from what I used to do professionally to what I do now So I mentioned that I got to that point where I realized for myself that I was following a broken model and teaching people like a really dangerous model, like this whole eat less, move more, harder, faster, more mentality. I believe it's not only not helpful in the long run, but it can also be really, really dangerous, like teaching people a really unhealthy definition of healthy, right? And I wasn't just teaching it. 
I become this recognized expert in all of that stuff. Now, this was before the times of Instagram, but You know, I was all over TV and magazines and newspapers and radio shows, and I was so deeply entrenched. And at the height of it, after realizing how out of alignment I was with myself and who I wanted to be as a teacher and a mentor and a coach, I decided to shut everything down. And people thought I was crazy. And I even probably thought I was a little bit crazy. But here's the part of the story that I never really shared because, again, I didn't necessarily know know how to explain it. So rewind about eight or nine years ago, I had this moment where I was on a paddleboard on Lake Orienta, which was my backyard at the time in Altamont Springs, which is outside of Orlando. And I was listening to Sarah Bareilles and on came this song, Hercules. And I'd probably heard this song a hundred times before that, probably like at the very least. So many times that I remember, like, I took it upon myself to Google and learn about Hercules because I had no idea, like, generally I knew who Hercules was, but I was like, let's Google this guy, right? And among other things, the one thing I remember reading, and this is what stuck out to me, was that, yeah, he was a warrior and a fighter, but he didn't fight for the sake of fighting. He fought when he needed to. It was to save lives or defend or protect in my mind, like he was a warrior with purpose. And so even though I'd heard that song about a hundred times at least, this particular day, the words hit me like a ton of bricks and it sent me straight down to my knees on the paddleboard, okay? And so I'm gonna just read some of the lyrics specifically that hit me and we'll, we'll talk about it in just a second. But here's the lyrics. It went, I miss the days my mind would just rest quiet. My imagination hadn't turned on me yet. I want to disappear and just start over. So here we are and I'll breathe again. And then another verse went, I've lost a grip on where I started from. I wish I'd thought ahead and left a few crumbs. I'm on the hunt for who I've not yet become, but I'd settle for a little equilibrium. And then she sings, There is a war inside my heart gone silent, both sides dissatisfied and somewhat violent. The issue I have now begun to see, I am the only lonely casualty. This is not the end though. And then the chorus went, cause I have sent for a warrior from on my knees, make me a Hercules. I was meant to be a warrior, please. Make me a Hercules. And so this time, the probably 100th time, and maybe those words don't mean anything to you, but the words of that song sent me crashing straight down to my knees and I was bawling and sobbing and left kneeling on a paddleboard in a puddle of my own tears because I knew it. I knew I had to go find the version of myself that I had not yet become and the war inside my head gone silent was because I didn't want to fight the weight loss battle anymore. I didn't want to fight the battle of the bulge anymore. I knew how empty it was for me and how, like I said, dangerous. My heart was, well, like for the heart, you know, I wanted to help women with the battle in their minds and the battle in their hearts. And that was my surrender on that paddleboard. Like that line from on my knees, make me a Hercules. Like that song to me was my way of talking to God and asking for help and asking for a lifeline and asking me to get out of the, basically it was like a prison of my own making. Like I created it by design. And by the way, this surrender, it was all through music. And so there I was, I was down on my knees and sobbing and praying for help. And even though, yes, I didn't call it that then, and I wouldn't have told you then that I was talking to God, but now I know I was. And so after I was done, I I just gathered myself up. I paddled back to shore. I walked in my house and I made a really bold decision. And it was probably the hardest decision of my life. And to some people at the time, they wouldn't have called it bold. They would have probably called it stupid or some other expletives, right? And so just to paint that picture, like I said, at this time in my life, 
I was at the top of my game. It wasn't like things weren't going well and I was ready to walk away. It was like, no, I was at the top of my game. So it was really a shock to anyone that knew me. Like, you know, I had this successful studio. I had a six figure income. I had a team working for me. I had this amazing community of women that I was the leader of. I had a segment, like a weekly TV segment that I had represented for nearly four years. Like every single Saturday I was on TV. I was in magazines and newspapers and they were calling me their fitness expert. And I went from that to suddenly realizing like I was part of the problem that I was teaching people this diet mentality and the eat less, move more mentality. And in general, this conversation that I knew didn't even equate to true and lasting peace of mind. And in that moment, on my knees, on my paddle board, in a puddle of my own tears is when I decided to just shut it all down and like step out into the unknown or at least just take the first step into my future, really having no idea that it would lead to what I'm doing now. I just knew I had to take a different path. And that was not easy. It was really just leaving my place of certainty for total uncertainty. And people would ask me, they'd be like, what are you going to do? And I would just answer, I really don't know, but I know I'm going to figure it out. And they'd be like, how are you going to make money? And I'm like, I don't know, but I'm going to figure it all out. And now I see that that was faith, even if I didn't call it that then, right? That knowingness in the midst of all of that, I didn't call it faith back then. But that was me trusting in God, and that was me having faith, believing in what I couldn't yet see or taste or smell or touch or even comprehend with my human mind. So fast forward to November of 2018, a little less than two years ago, And a lot of amazing things transpired in between. But because I'm human and that's how transformation works, I found myself back on my knees in surrender once again. And the details of which aren't relevant, but I'll share a little bit of it in a moment. This time, though, it was in a different way. But nonetheless, I was back on my knees in tears and something inside of me was like, Leanne, you need to surrender. And The idea of, you know, maybe do I want God? I don't. And again, I didn't have God at the time, but I remember thinking like, do I want God? Do I like, is this what I'm looking for? And it crossed my mind, but I hadn't fully gotten there yet. The word surrender just coming, kept coming up for me. Like this feeling of like something or someone, please save me. I can't do this on my own anymore. And so there I was looking for the word surrender and probably like the Sarah Bareilles version of it because that's what I knew. And I went looking for it. I went looking for God for the first time ever. And for whatever reason, I didn't have this desire to go to a temple or a synagogue. And living in Nashville, I was like, whoa, I bet we have insanely good church music here because I mean it's music city right so I just asked around to some friends like who has the best worship music in town and a few different people said that I should check out Crosspoint so of course my first natural response was are Jews just allowed to walk into a church I mean I had no idea and they were all just like uh yes of course their tagline is everybody's welcome nobody's perfect anything is possible And I was like, everybody's welcome. That means the Jews are welcome too. Yes, I'm in like, and we all had a chuckle of course, right? But but truly I didn't know that you could just walk in. Anybody could walk in. So I immediately called my friend Kevin. And okay, so this is actually the second person in this story named Kevin. And so for clarity's sake, this is my friend Kevin, not Pastor Kevin. Um, And my friend Kevin, who I've known for nearly 10 years, and he's not only one of the wisest and most influential people in my life, but ironically, he's the one person who he's been speaking to me since I've known him about scripture and the power of Jesus. And I always regarded him as insanely wise, like beyond gifted and crazy crazy, intelligent, and wise for his years. But in all honesty, I wasn't really interested in all the Jesus stuff that he talked to me about, right? So at this time, I was looking for surrender. I finally, it finally got me to the point where I was like, I think I want God. And I called him and I was like, hey, I want to go to church, but I'm scared to just walk in by myself. Will you come with me? 
And so I went on to share with him that there's this place called Cross Point and they're supposed to have the best worship music in town and I want to check it out. Like I told him the whole thing and it was a big hell yes from him. Like he was so excited and so honored because he would never ever push faith onto me. He was always just inviting me into bigger conversations and he was so excited that I wanted to go. So we walked into Cross Point and I immediately got goosebumps. Like just walking into the auditorium and hearing the worship music and simply being there, it just moved me. But that wasn't enough for Kevin. Like he wanted me to experience it from up front. And he walked me right up to the second row where there were two empty seats and he sat me down in the second row. And so, like I said, I love the music immediately, but I have to admit, because I wasn't really raised around the word Jesus and songs about Jesus and the story of Jesus. So for me to be praying and singing to Jesus and hearing the word Jesus in all the songs, it just felt a little bit weird. And so I just replaced the word Jesus in all the songs with the word universe or with God. And with that little tweak, it all totally resonated with me, like big time resonance, like the messages themselves all resonated. But the word Jesus was simply just, it was new to me. Regardless, I was totally intrigued and completely moved, like goosebumps moved from the music. I can't even describe it. Like it totally, you know, to my bones, I remember it moved me. So after the worship team sang a few songs, Pastor Kevin came out to preach. And I say now that I came for the music and stayed for Pastor Kevin's sermon because, wow, he just spoke to me. Now, I've never had a pastor before, and so he was my first pastor, but I just immediately loved his message. Like, I loved his self-deprecating humor. Like, he's not afraid to make fun of himself. And I love how he shares about his family and we can learn through the eyes of his own life experiences. And I love that to me, he was just kind of showing me this picture of Jesus and just essentially trying, saying to me like, hey, try it on. Like he didn't specifically say that to me, but that's what it felt like from you know the, the messages that were coming through him. Now, keep this in mind too, as you're listening to us Jewish kids growing up, like we didn't hear about Jesus. Or if we did, it was kind of in this context of Jesus. Jesus being like the Easter bunny, like a fan, you know, a fictional character. So for me, that's exactly what my first step had to be. I had to simply try it all on, right? So I tried on this story. I tried on this, uh, this story, this idea that God sent his son to die for our sins and take away our shame and our guilt and our self-condemnation. And I tried on the idea that there's this way for me to allow myself to kind of like rebirth myself and not have to walk around with all that shame any longer. And shame is something that it was my emotional home since I can remember, right? And really to step into this idea that I am whole and complete right now and that I don't have to work for it or lose weight for it or create more business or financial success for it, that I'm just whole and complete right now and that God loves me right now. And it's this kind of love that I can't even fathom with my own eyes. Like that's basically the gist of the story that I started trying on. So when I heard all of that, I was like, yes, I will totally try that on. Like, give it to me. Give it all to me now. Like, it was music to my ears. So from there on out, I just, like, immersed myself in these concepts for the months to come. Like, I didn't care about labels or whether I was being, like, a good Jew or a bad Jew or doing Christianity right or doing it wrong. I just immersed myself in the scripture and the worship music. And I went to church every chance I could get. Like Sundays became my favorite day. Like I never missed a service. I just totally felt at home there right at cross point. And so here is where I'll be the first to say that, yeah, I could have found God through Judaism and I'm sure I could have, but I did it. And or like maybe I just wasn't ready to or whatever it was like Judaism just never equated to God or faith to me. And the God that I pray to, like he doesn't care if I get it from a church or a temple, from a pastor or from a rabbi. He's just glad that after 35 years, I'm here now and I'm having conversations with him now. Like that's what I say about it anyways, you know. 
So there were like a couple of concepts that still didn't resonate with me just yet. There was this idea of having the Holy Spirit living within me. And then there was this idea of having Jesus, you know, save me and follow him and be my my Lord and my Savior. And so this is where the story continues. And I swear the stuff that just kept happening to me, like I can't make this stuff up. Okay. So about a week after my first church experience, I found out from a friend that the Goodwill across the road from my neighborhood, it has this huge selection of books. And so I walked across the street to browse their books. Now, I don't want to say that a book fell off the shelf at me. It didn't like literally fall off the shelf, but it's like it was peeking its head out at me and all of the other books just agreed to stand down so that I could see that one book. (laughs) So... I pulled it out and it was called Let Your Spirit Guides Speak. And so in my mind, it made me try on this idea of spirit guides to see if that connected with me more in terms of connecting with this idea of Holy Spirit. Um, And once again, the God that I pray to doesn't care how I get it or what I call it. He just wants me to get the message, right? So I bought the book and I gobbled it up that very day. It was very like conversationally written. It was just my style. And so I was able to just kind of, you know, read it very quickly. It was a short book. Um, And then I noticed on the back cover that it mentioned it was written by the same author that wrote a book called The Only Little Prayer That You Need. So I went and Googled the author and I checked out the only little prayer that you need because I was just super curious to know what was that one little prayer that I needed. Because if you've been listening to this podcast for a while, you know I'm all about baby steps, right? And the idea of prayer to me, to somebody who never prayed and never had God, it was still such a massive concept to me at the time. And so if somebody went and deciphered it and like came up with the only little prayer that I needed, I wanted that prayer. (laughs) So after some Googling, I realized that the prayer was just so elegant in its simplicity. It went like this. It says, please help me heal my fear-based thoughts about X. And then you fill in the blank with X. Please help me heal my fear-based thoughts about X. So I just wrote that little prayer on a note card And I just tried on this idea that like, what if I have spirit guides or a spirit that lives inside of me? And if I could just tune into that frequency, these spirit guides would help me and lead me. Again, I just tried it on. Like I tried it on as an idea. And like everything that I'm sharing with you, it was just me just using my imagination and trying this stuff on and just seeing how it felt. And when I tried on that little prayer, The first things that came up for me were, and and this is where I'm going to just be totally transparent and totally vulnerable. The first things that came up for me were, please help me heal my fear-based thoughts about being alone the rest of my life. Please help me heal my fear-based thoughts about money. And please help me heal my fear-based thoughts about stepping into my purpose and using my God-given gifts. Like those are the three things. They just came to me immediately. So I wrote those three things on a note card and I went up to Shelby Park, which is this beautiful park down the road for me. And I rented a bike from the bike share program that we have here in Nashville. It's called B-Cycle. And I just got on my bike and I rode and I rode and I rode. And now riding at Shelby Park wasn't anything new to me, but as As I was riding, all of a sudden, I saw this left-hand turn that I had never actually taken before. So I decided to take a left, and I just kept riding until all of a sudden, I was just riding up this massive hill. And at the top of the hill, I ended up at this bridge that overlooks the Cumberland River. And now, I've been to Shelby Park so many times, and I've never ended up on this road or on this bridge. So I walked my bike out to the middle of the bridge, and I got off the bike, and I just stood there. And I stood there, and I stared over at the water into the rocks on the side of the river, and I just, I don't know, I just started speaking to my spirit guides, and I started speaking to God. Like, I didn't plan it. It just sort of happened. It felt right in the moment. And I said something along the lines of like, hey, um, I can't see you. And I know we've never met. I know we've never spoken, but I want to know you. I want to talk to you. I want to hear from you. Um, And I can't explain it, but I pretty immediately, I just felt the spirit there. I felt it there. I felt them there. I felt like my spirit guides were there. 
I felt God. And so I proceeded to say that little prayer out loud. Again, I didn't plan any of this. It just kind of happened. And so I said, please help me heal my fear-based thoughts about being alone the rest of my life. And please help me heal my fear-based thoughts about money. And please help me heal my fear-based thoughts about stepping into my purpose and using my God-given gifts. And once again, I just felt them there. And I felt this rush come through me that I've never experienced before. And again, I can't fully explain it. But this peace just came over me. And for the first time ever, I really felt God. Like I called it God at the time. It was my first time, you know. And God didn't just seem like this thing that was so far away that everybody else had access to. I felt like I finally had access. Like I felt God. And again, it's a feeling that I can't necessarily describe, but I'm doing my best to just describe it to you right now. And so I stayed for a while and until I just like I felt like I was ready to head back. And so feeling totally high at this point, like I was just high, you know, I got back on my bike and I started to ride back to where my car was parked. And on the way, I noticed that there was a family stopped and they, it turns out they were stopped because they were looking at a couple of deer on the side of the road. And so I got off my bike and I stopped to just marvel at the deer as well. Cause deers are kind of like my spirit animal or deer are, I just made up the plural of deers. But anyways, so I'm standing there and eventually the family left, but I just stayed there and I was just staring at the deer and marveling. And again, just like praising God essentially. And the deer was staring back at me and, um, deer, like they usually, run away pretty quickly right but I swear this one deer after a few minutes of just silence and just staring at each other it actually took a step towards me and we had this moment it was like a really short moment because another biker just whooshed by and scared the deer and he ran off but I had this moment with this deer and once again I felt God right And so now don't get me wrong, like I know you can give any story any meaning and this is obviously the meaning that I'm choosing to give it, but this is what happened for me and how I experienced it. Before that, like I'd never had a deer walk and take steps towards me, but this day, like one did, you know? Um, And that's when I was just like, you know what? What do I have to lose? Like, what if I started believing in God and believing in miracles and believing in this idea that I don't have to carry around shame anymore and believing that I'm here for a purpose and that God has my back and that even when I'm technically alone in this world, I am never alone in this world because I have this ever-present spirit that is protecting me and watching over me and lives within me. And again, This is the story I decided to try on. And it's a story that, again, like as a Jewish girl, I was never given this story to try on. In fact, I don't know, I probably would have been shamed for it, right? But there I was and I decided to try it on for myself and just see how it all felt. And I know to anybody who's a non-believer or like a doubter, like it seems crazy or fantastical or whimsical or whatever. But from that day on, my life was never the same. Okay, so from there on out, I threw myself into spirituality. I'm like, if I'm going to try this on, I'm going to really just invest and try it on. And like, I wasn't rushing to call myself a Christian or like give myself any labels or anything like that. I was just simply a Jewish girl who was really, 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 really curious about Christianity because as soon as I started learning about it, my heart opened, like my heart softened and I became open to miracles. But Because I had a strong belief system and a very solid sense of my own identity from all of the, you know, personal development work and the self growth work that I've been doing on myself and my self image for the past 15 years, I wasn't looking to just believe in something because I thought I was supposed to or thought I should. I really needed for it to resonate with, like really resonate completely within me. So for the next year, I immersed myself in everything. And I mean totally. I essentially became this student with an insatiable hunger. And so I went to church every single Sunday. Like sometimes I would actually double dip and go to two different services. I Like Sunday became my favorite day. Um, 
Then I found out that they had these things called open prayer, which at my church, anyone could just come on Tuesdays and pray and get prayed over. And there was acoustic worship. And so I just started scheduling them into my week and making that non-negotiable. And when I first started going, like I had no idea what I was looking for. I didn't know how to pray. And sometimes, honestly, I would just go and sit in the back and cry because I was just like in this massive surrender. Like emotionally, I was just turning over a lot. And so like I was very just emotionally raw, I guess you could say. And the three things that kept coming up for me were please help me heal my fears that I'm going to be alone the rest of my life or my fear-based thoughts. Please help me heal my fear-based thoughts that I'm not going to be financially stable or my fears about money. And please help me heal my fear-based thoughts that I'm not going to step into my purpose, like my true God-given purpose. Even though, unbeknownst to me, I already had and already was, but those were the things that I started with, right? So... Um, then it's actually at that open prayer that I met two very important people. One was pastor Kevin, which I told you about, we're going to talk more about. Um, but basically like one day I had the courage to just go up to him and say hi and thank him. Like, thanks for being my first pastor. Right. And so he asked me like, how long have you been coming to cross point? And I just answered him very honestly and openly. And I just said like, actually I've only been coming a couple weeks. You know, this is my first church. You're my first pastor. I'm actually Jewish. And I literally think I told him that I was just like dipping my toes into the whole Christianity thing or something like that. Like those were the words I was using and nobody cared. He was like, awesome. Like, and by the way, again, nobody was trying to convert me. Like no one was trying to, you know, save me or anything like that. They were just so excited for me that I was there and that I was taking this journey at my own pace. And Pastor Kevin was no different. He was so excited for me. And I remember he asked me a little bit about myself. And so, you know, I shared with him that I'm Jewish, but it was never really a religious thing or a connection to God and that I speak Hebrew and I lived in Israel, but that I'm seeking surrender and I'm seeking faith. And he immediately offered me any support that I needed. He told me like if I wanted to meet or if I had any questions about the Old Testament versus the New Testament to just let him know. And I think I literally told him, I'm like, "Um, I actually don't even know anything about the Old Testament, so it's really not a problem. (laughs) I mean, I was just totally transparent with him, right? Regardless, I'd started this conversation with Pastor Kevin that was coming from just such a place of freedom and exploration and no pressure, like no pressure from his end, no judgment. He just let me be where I was, like he always did. And, you know, I'll stop there for now because I'm going to come back to Pastor Kevin in just a moment. Um, But the other pivotal person I met there at Open Prayer was my dear friend, Scott. And we got to talking, and he now jokingly calls me the Crosspoint Jew. But in our first conversation, he was like, okay, this might sound a little bit weird, but I really want to hook you up with my wife, Malia. (laughs) So he connected me with his wife, Malia, and we became instant friends. And Scott and Malia have been such an amazing support system for me throughout my journey. But after hanging out with Malia a couple of times, she said to me, you know, I don't really like share her with everyone, but I really, really want you to meet my spiritual mentor, Gina. And I think it would be really powerful for you to plug into one of her groups that she leads. She actually leads a bunch of female groups, women's groups. So she introduced me to Gina, who is another pivotal person in my journey. And I met with Gina And I shared with Gina just what I told you already in this episode, like that I'm exploring, that I'm just, you know, dipping my toes in to see what this is all about. And she was just like, hey, come check out a bunch of my female groups. Just like check them out, see which one resonates with you and just experience it. So I came to her Monday night group and I loved it immediately. Like I knew these were my people. These were my women. So I started going to Monday nights. And again, like this group of women, they were just so supportive, like always meeting me where I was. No one was trying to pressure me or convert me or make me see something that I wasn't ready for. But like, obviously I was all in. So by this point, like I'm at church on Sundays, sometimes more than once. (laughs) I'm at Gina's on Monday nights. I was at open prayer on Tuesdays. Um, Oh yeah. And I got involved at the dream center on Wednesday nights, which is through Crosspoint, where 
you basically get to hang out and mentor middle school and high school students. And then um, Ketrick and Allie and Dan from the Dream Center, they were also an amazing support system for me as I was just, you know, figuring everything out. It was a lot to take in and I was just exploring my faith. And so, like I said, though, I was all in, like totally immersed and it was transforming me to my core. I can't explain it, but I was just, I could feel I was being transformed inside. And by the way, all of these people that I'm mentioning, they have been so supportive of my journey and Kevin and Kevin and Gina and Scott, they're all actually going to be on this podcast. They've all agreed to be here, but I'm just kind of sharing a little bit about them right now. Um, but the bottom line is, I just immersed myself in all of this, like not trying to make any rules about what any of it meant. I wasn't trying to determine whether or not I was a Christian or a Jewish or if I was a good Jew or a bad Jew or anything like that, even though, of course, that like crossed my mind. I'm like, ah, am I a bad Jew? Um, I was just giving myself permission to explore and not give it any titles or judgments or labels or anything to just connect with God and practice my version of faith and figure out what that even meant. Meanwhile, my stressless eating clients were getting insane transformations, like life transforming results. And I discovered that not only was this not just my business, it was my God given purpose. And I was stepping into that. And it's ironic how one of my unanswered prayers was right under my nose and had been answered. It had already been answered. Like I was already living in my God given purpose. I just hadn't realized it and I didn't call it that. But the more that I was able to be compassionate with myself and love myself through the eyes of God and find even deeper layers of self-love, the more I was able to give it back to my clients and invite them into deeper levels of self-love. So needless to say, it was a big year. You know, it was my first year of, you know, just dipping my toes into the story and picture of God where I looked at it like I was trying on this framework and I just got to know this guy called Jesus. Like I tried on his words and writings and I surrounded myself with people that already air quotes follow him to see what this idea of following him even looks like. And I just immersed myself into that. Meanwhile, my experience at church was amazing. Like I said, everyone was so supportive. They weren't trying to like push me or convert me or anything like that. They were just so glad I was there and so excited for me and happy for me. So this went on for about a year when little did I know things were about to just really accelerate. So fast forward to November 2018, just a couple weeks before I'm in Pastor Kevin's office, which I promise I'll get to in a minute because that's where things got crazy. I was part of this business strategy group and it was like a mastermind and I was in Atlantis in the Bahamas. And while I was there, I had a personal like download, if you want to call it that. I had this revelation that my relationship that I was in, it wasn't the relationship for me anymore. And and one of the reasons was because not only did I feel like he didn't really see me, like he didn't see Leanne Ellington and all the ways that I wanted to be seen um, and appreciate things about me that like didn't involve how I looked or my success or any of that superficial stuff. And again, another topic for another episode. But I also just felt like we were just in such different places in our faith. And I was like, whoa, that's interesting because I never cared about that before when it came to dating. Like that was all of a sudden a really important thing for me to share with my partner. So that was definitely new. Like that was the first awareness, right? But this was like the first of so many realizations about just how much this past year had shifted my heart and shifted my identity. And so for whatever reason, going to Atlantis, it was just kind of like the catalyst for what was about to happen. And I jokingly call it my holy trinity because I got back home and I broke up with my boyfriend. I dropped out of that business mastermind realizing that my business didn't actually need like a business makeover. I just needed to fully like own and step into the idea that God gave me my gifts and my struggles and my suffering for a reason and to just use that. Um, and then the third thing, and, and this is the part that hit me like a ton of bricks and I, I can't explain it. And in all honesty, this is where, hey, I might lose some of you, but I just realized I was ready to like 
fully surrender. Like, let God, like, for a lack of, like, let God lead me. And really, for a lack of a better way of saying it, let, let Jesus take the wheel. And for a short time, you know, after this, like, full surrender, things got really, really dark for me. Like, really dark. And I know some people have this full surrender moment and come to Jesus and it's all like roses and butterflies. But for me, it was like all of my old stories of shame and fear and self-condemnation. It's like they all came back and hit me like a wave. And so this went on for quite a few weeks. And after about probably four weeks, um, it kind of subsided and I started feeling, you know, the fruits of my surrender. I started like, it's like a wave lifted or a fog lifted. And I remember the week after Thanksgiving, I reached out to Pastor Kevin and I was like, okay, uh, yep, I'm ready to talk now. <laughs> um, and I don't remember exactly what I said in that email, but I can only imagine I was a blubbering idiot, like telling him about the dark places I'd been to and my deep surrender, but that I was in, like I was all in. Um, and he messaged me back pretty much immediately and he said he'd be happy to meet with me, but also that he had shared a bit about my story with his wife, Re, and wanted to offer her support as well. And I was ecstatic. Like, I was obviously so excited because I felt like I knew her. Like, I saw her at all the open prayers and I heard her pray on Tuesdays. And to have her there was like such a gift. I was over the moon to get a chance to sit down with both of them. Um, and so this is where the story gets really crazy. It, it really does. Like, so we set up a time to meet on a Tuesday before open prayer. That Monday, I was working out at the gym inside my apartment complex, and I felt this big, like, wave of anxiety and scarcity and kind of like my own victim mentality. And I had this awareness that I was in my own victim mentality, and I was focusing on the problems and what I didn't have and what wasn't working in my life. And then... I had this wave rush over me. Like, and by the way, I'm just using, I don't know how to describe it. So I'm just trying to use words as best as I can. When I say like there was a wave rush over me, it was just like a feeling. And it was this like rush of clarity, but it was also this like big wave of gratitude. I was like, here I am in my gym working out. My life is good. Like stop feeling sorry for yourself. Like it was one of those moments. And it was like this gratitude for all that I do have. And I had this moment again where I was like, you're feeling all this scarcity. And then I had what I can only describe as Holy Spirit rush through me. And I just felt this wave that said $500. Um, I know it sounds really weird. It sounds crazy. It did to me too. But I just felt like $500 and I heard, I'm saying heard, but I don't know how to describe it. Single mother. So... I just felt like I was supposed to give $500 to a single mother. And in my mind and in my heart, it was like not to buy Christmas presents or pay it forward at Starbucks. It was like for a dire need. Meanwhile, after I dropped out of my mastermind, I actually hired a coach to help me really make over my scarcity mindset and to also help me get out of debt. So those wandering years that I had after I closed my fitness studio... I'm not proud to admit, but like I went into debt for the first time ever. And to be honest, it was like just the least of my worries to even think about getting out of debt. So I just let it be there. Um, and her name is Toyin and she was an amazing, again, another pivotal person in my life. And she just so happened to be a faith-based financial coach who was in ministry before she was in the financial world. And she was committed to helping people change their money story and their, like really their identity. So I came to her and I told her straight up that I knew that my money story and my self-image were directly tied and that my scarcity mentality wasn't just financial for me. Like I knew I had scarcity and fear, um, like that mindset around a lot of other things in my life. So this was like our second week working together, right? And as soon as I felt this twinge or like this wave that I was supposed to give $500 to a single mother... I texted her telling her that I was going that I thought I was supposed to give $500 to a single mother and I was just expecting her to tell me like are you crazy like we're trying to get you out of debt right but she texted me back right away with do it 
She texts me back with do it, okay? And then she texted me again being like, hey, do it, but don't commit to doing it like regularly in the future. But like, this is God speaking to you. Like, this is the Holy Spirit. So I went to the ATM and I took out $500 that honestly, I really didn't have like an extra $500 to spend, but I put it in an envelope to take it with me to Kevin the next day. And that night, I swear, the floodgates to my business opened and little did I know that my financial troubles and my debt were about to become a non-issue, but I I digress. So I went to Kevin's office the next day to meet with he and his wife, Ree. And so before we sat down to talk, I said like, hey, I got to do this before I chicken out. But like, I I don't know who this is for and I've never done anything like this before, but this envelope has $500 in it and I feel like it's supposed to go to a single mother. And I went on to say, like, I don't think it's for Christmas presents or paying it forward at Starbucks or anything like that. I feel like it's for a really like a dire need. And Pastor Kevin immediately said to me, I think I know exactly who it's for. And he went on to tell me about this woman and her family who had just moved here from Africa. Like their number got called. They were in like war torn Africa. Their number got called in the lottery to immigrate to the U.S. And they had four children, like a 12 year old, a 10 year old, a seven year old, a two year old. And then a fifth child on the way. Like she was pregnant and not far from giving birth when she moved here. And her husband, he like had a job waiting for him and he was waiting to start, like waiting for his social security card to come in. And in the meantime, he was actually volunteering until he could start working and he got killed in a car accident. Like it was sudden. It was a shock. He, he died in a car accident. So there was this single mother a widow, brand new to the USA, about to give birth. She barely spoke English, new to this country. Can't even imagine what she was going through. And despite all of that, Kevin told me that she just had so much joy and gratitude radiating through her. Like he was telling me about her and she was like, she's just a bundle of joy. And so I was like, yes, give it to her. Like I want her to have the money. And he was like, well, like I can give it to her or you can give it to her. Like, do you want to meet her? And I was like, uh, isn't this stuff supposed to be anonymous? And he's like, no, this doesn't have to be anonymous. Like, do you want to meet her? And so I was like, okay, like I, I'd love to meet her. So, um, anyways, he set me up with this woman, Donna, everybody calls her Miss Donna. And she is um, kind of the intermediary. She takes care of all of the refugee families that come to Nashville. Um, And so he hooked me up with her to just arrange a time to go over there and give them the money. And so we chatted and we agreed to go over there on Saturday and give them the money and just kind of like surprise them. Like they had no idea we were coming. So Friday, I'm walking at Shelby Park because I live there. I like love going to Shelby. And I got a call from Donna and she was like, okay, I know you're a new believer. Um, but like, this is what he does. These are the kinds of miracles that happen. She's like, are you sitting down? And I'm like, what's going on? And she was basically like, okay, Celine and the children, um, they've been living in this apartment and it's the last place they saw their father and husband alive. Um, and they have, the kids are having nightmares. They like have, they've been staying with a friend. Like, it's just like really awful. His stuff is still there. Like just like bad memories, you know, and they want a fresh start and they want to move to a different unit in their current neighborhood, but there aren't any available. Um, And then like one apparently became available. And so they called her and they talked to her niece um, and they told her like we have one available and her niece basically had to say no, like we can't accept it because we don't have the money to do that because they needed, yep, you guessed it, $500 to the T. So Donna found out about this and called the apartment complex and was like, don't give away the apartment. Like Celine has no idea, but there is a total stranger coming to her house on Saturday or tomorrow with exactly $500. It was so crazy. So Celine and I are like, what is going on? Like, what are the odds of this? Right? So we went over there the next day and we gave her the money and it was just like the most beautiful experience. And we like that we were crying. And we all just, you know, celebrated what was happening. And I held the baby and I met all the children. And it was just this full circle story. And I've never experienced anything like it. I mean, what are the odds? 
that I was prompted randomly to just give away the exact dollar amount to a single mother who needed a gift from God more than any other time in her life. And there was a family who needed that exact dollar amount at that time in history for this life changing reason. Like I couldn't believe it. Um, and after this, I was like, okay, God, <laughs> I see you. I, I get it. I see what you're doing. Um, I can get behind this whole miracle thing. Like it made me a believer. You know what I mean? So I'm driving home from Celine's house and um, my phone starts ringing from a number that I didn't recognize. So I, I hit reject. I rejected the call. Um, but then I got a text saying, hey, I just heard what happened. Like, you've got to tell me the story. And that's when I realized it was Pastor Kevin. I'm like, whoops, I just totally rejected a call from my pastor. <laughs> so I called him back and I just told him all the details of what had just happened. And we just sat there and basked in all that was happening and the miracle that transpired or the coincidence as former versions of myself would have called it. And that's when I declared to him, I was like, okay, I am so inspired and moved by what happened. I want to see what happens when I just like really give my life over to God. Like I'm going to give my business over to God. Like he's 51% owner and I'm going to give my future husband over to God. And I just want to live with an open heart like this in every area of my life. Um, and that's when he said something to me that seemed probably seems like really small to an outsider, but it meant everything to me because up until this point, I hadn't really told my family about any of this. Like, I mean, I mentioned to all of them at some point in time. And I think at Thanksgiving, I mentioned it even more that I had been, you know, going to a church and getting involved in some volunteer work and stuff like that. But I'd never really shared that I had found God and found faith, let alone through the, you know, the route of Christianity. Um, and so on the phone that day, Kevin said something to me that was so powerful. He said, Leanne, I am so proud of you. And that's what inspired me to do what I did next. I got off the phone with him and I texted my parents and I was like, hey, I want to share something with you. Can, can you guys talk? So I got on the phone with my mom and my dad and I told them about the miracles that had been happening in my life and how my business was thriving in this whole new way. Like, again, that's another thing. Like the, um, the women that came to me, like my clients, just everything was just flowing um, and how I was so purposeful and in this flow and how my anxiety and shame and all of those emotions that I'd been experiencing and managing for a long time now, but like needed to manage all the time and meditate and take care of every day like how they were just no longer present in my life like totally gone like I just didn't have to manage any of it anymore like and, and then of course I shared the story with them of that like magical $500 and they just listened and celebrated with me and they were super supportive and so before we hung up I said listen I, I want to share something with you and it's not that I need your approval but I mean, you're my mom and my dad, and I don't care how old I get, I'm always gonna want your approval. Um, but I went on to say, like, listen, I am Jewish, and I am proud to be Jewish, and nothing will ever change that. But I also found God, and my faith has totally transformed my life, and I'm also a Christian. Like, I truly believe that I'm both. I'm Jewish and I'm Christian. Um, and they were both amazing. They were just like, hey, whatever makes you happy, we support that. And our beliefs don't necessarily need to align. But if you're happy, we're happy. And we just love you and support you. And we're proud of you. And so this thing that seems so scary to me, you know, like a Jewish girl telling her parents that she's a Jew and a Christian, it was no longer a big deal. And I could kind of, you know, live out in the open. And it just happened just like that. Um, and, you know, just to kind of, you know, just to kind of round out the story, everything since then has been a miracle. Like, truly, I, I turned my business over to God and said, God, please deliver the perfect women that absolutely need my help that you designed me to serve. And he has done that and then some. And I turned over, you know, all of my coping mechanisms to God. I said, you know, God, help me shift my emotional home from anxiety and fear and shame 
to peace. And I truly live in peace where, again, I don't need to meditate for hours a day and do yoga to find peace. I just wake up with peace. Um, and crazy story that I'll have to share for another time. But like I turned over my debt to God and I got out of debt in record time. And I turned over my career to God and said, hey, use me. Like, use me to help the women that need me. Use my story and my suffering and my shame and my experiences and let me be a vessel for healing. And that's really what prompted me to finally launch this podcast that it's been in my heart for a long time before it actually came out. And I could go on and on about all the ways that my life has shifted and I'm just at peace. I have more love. I have more self-love and the capacity to love others that much more. And pretty much everybody that sees me now, they say to me like, I don't know what's different about you, but there is something different about you. Like they've, I've been told several times that there's just a light inside of me that's shining brighter than it ever was. So apparently I, I just look different. I don't know. Um, and I mean, we're living in some really interesting times right now. I mean, we are like six months into this whole, you know, worldwide pandemic. And at the beginning of it all, I remember saying to God, like, again, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna hand it over to you, God, like grow me and let me help people heal and let my stressless eating program and my knowledge and my stories be a bright light in these dark times and let it be a vessel for healing. And even though 2020 has been crazy and full of a lot of hardship for so many people, it's really been such a beautiful year internally for me and for my spiritual growth and my business is growing and it's allowing me to help more and more women that are in suffering and to help them get out of suffering. And it's shown me that even in times of uncertainty like this, like there's so much good that can happen. There's so much silver lining and I really don't believe I would have looked at my life in this way for the past six months, like during a pandemic without God and without my faith. So yeah, this was one of definitely one of my most vulnerable episodes to date. And you know, I shared some sides of myself that I've never shared. And some of you might be wondering like, what's this have to do with stressless eating? Like what's God got to do with this? Well, I would argue that it has everything to do with it because, you know, this podcast and my message is about helping diet obsessed women just break themselves out of the shame and food and body prisons where it's not just the food or your body or your weight that's causing all the suffering. It's the conversations that are going on in your head and your heart and just being disconnected from all the self-love and self-compassion that's available to you right now. And that's what's causing the struggles with food and health and your body. And I truly believe that as I've allowed my faith to expand me and open me up to even deeper meanings of love and self-compassion, I'm able to pass it on to all of you that are listening. And to say that my new relationship with God has transformed my life, well, that would be the understatement of the century. Like, every part of me is different. You know, mind, body, spirit, my health and fitness, my business, my finances, the way I approach dating, like all of it. And the hope that I have for my future. Like I just believe now. I just believe that I get to have it all and that I get to have my happy ending. And to be honest, you know, before I had faith, I wasn't always so sure. Like I had success on the outside, but I never fully felt it on the inside. And now I just get to live wholeheartedly. And so let me just be clear, like this is not me trying to convert you or talk you into anything. Like I'm just simply here to share my experiences and share my truths and share some of the miracles that have happened to me over the past couple of years, but especially over the past 10 months and invite you into possibility because we get to write the stories of our lives. Like we get to give our lives whatever meaning we want to give it. We get to step into whatever story we choose. Choose. And 
I chose to try on a story that to some people seems unrealistic or unbelievable, or to me, it used to feel downright outlandish, but trying on the frameworks and the principles and the idea of miracles and putting myself and my life into those frameworks, it was absolutely transformational. And I wouldn't be who I am today if I didn't at least share my truths here on this podcast and let you know a big part of what contributed to who I am today and the messages that I share. So thank you so much for just letting me share this and being a witness to my journey and my testimony. And if there's any voice inside of you that's making you think that you don't get to have miracles or that you don't get to have a life of abundance and love and connection and prosperity and, you know, feeling connected to something bigger than yourself, Never say never. I promise you, I would have never guessed that this would have been my story. But God obviously had other plans for me, and I'm thankful for that every single day. Thanks for tuning in to today's show. If you like what you heard and you're interested in breaking out of your own food, body, and diet prison, here's what I want you to do next. Head on over to StresslessEating.com. That's StresslessEating.com. And sign up to watch the Stressless Eating webinar where I'll walk you through the exact five-step game plan my female clients use to conquer emotional eating, self-sabotage, and finally heal themselves from the restrictive all-or-nothing diet mentality for good. But without obsessing or spending years in therapy to address it, I've laid it all out for you there in five easy steps. Remember, healing your relationship with food and your body does not happen by itself. You need expert guidance to make it happen, and we've helped clients all over the world take back their power from the food and find true and lasting freedom while enjoying life and warm chocolate chip cookies along the way. To see if we can help you do the same, head on over to StresslessEating.com. I'm Leanne Ellington, and I'll see you next time.